That's uh, that's really nice of you. You know, there's a there's a saying if you're a, a graduate of the Rotman School, um, and and when the Rotman person tells this, they'll say, you know, what does a Rotman grad and an Ivy grad have in common? And the answer, of course, is they both got accepted to Ivy. Um, and when the Ivy grad says it, they both got accepted to Toronto. <laughs> and uh, but you know, you're. Um, I'm, I'm very proud, actually, of, uh, of Ivy. It, uh, it, it put Canada on the map, and it is one of, uh, of the world's great business institutions, and uh, we're blessed to have it here in London and, uh, and in Canada. Grant, thanks a lot for um, uh, inviting me, and over the next uh, hour and a half, I will, uh, Grant is just sort of like, oh my <laughs> gosh, no, they didn't tell you that. Um, it's great to be back in London. You know, I, I've, I've got a particular affinity to London. When I started in my business career, uh, I was in the consulting business, and um, I then uh, was uh, headhunted to go to uh, People's Jewelers, which I, where I eventually became president. And I remember being having this vibrant downtown in London, and then I went through the phases in the, in the 80s and 90s of, of closing you know, stores in London, our big store that we had downtown. And then, you know, I've seen the, the revitalization and the thing that I find amazing about Londoners are they're tremendously resilient, entrepreneurial, um, and have a real sense of community about how you build this. And I, I, I look around the room, uh, we have people here from uh, the Center for Social Innovation, uh, we have Junior Achievement here, the London Community Foundation, uh, people that I've known uh, at, uh, at, uh, at uh, Pillar. Uh, you know, it's, it's just an amazing uh, opportunity here in London. I'd also like to recognize my two colleagues, Grant and Joe, who are here, and also uh, my colleagues who are on the advisory uh, board at Banting. And I, I, I would really like you, if you, you don't have to stand, but would just put up your hands to be recognized for all the great work you do on, on keeping a national historic site right here in London. And if it was not for you, uh, the flame of hope would not be where it is. And, and God bless you all. We, we're very proud of what you do. 93 years ago, uh, Banting discovered insulin. And if, uh, if you're not aware, at that time, diabetes was a death sentence. Uh, you could not survive diabetes. You simply wasted away. Um, and his discovery, you know, you know, we're so often humble about Canadians, whether it's Bethune or whether it's Banting, he changed the world for millions and millions and millions of people. To the point even when he sold his formula for insulin he gave it away for a dollar because he had no desire for any commercial value. He wanted the world to have insulin and he wanted to make it as economically possible as possible. And so when I wanted to then think of this and I sort of said, well, as I think of all of you who are both in the for-profit and not-for-profit sector, I wanted to sort of think about what is the not-for-profit sector in Canada? Many people don't realize how big it is. I certainly didn't realize how big it is before, it, uh, before I joined it. So there are 170,000 charities in Canada. The, um, the sector represents $106 billion of GDP. That's 8% of Canada's GDP. And the sector employs over 2 million people. That is between three and six times the size of the automotive sector. So often we think of, boy, how do we keep automotive sector going? Very important. But how do we also keep the not-for-profit sector going? And that's very important. And so, as you can see, um, the not-for-profit sector is a vital part of what we do. And using the word vital, and I would recognize the report that the London Community Foundation came out with their vital signs report uh, just yesterday. 
And um, I understand now that you are a journalist and you've got, you'll be soon signing autographs at the back of the room. They'll forget who Rick ever was. Um, when you go from running a for-profit business to a not-for-profit business, my prophet Harvard would say, running a for-profit is like playing chess. And running a not-for-profit is like playing checkers. And I will tell you, I have run $5 billion organizations. And this is the toughest job I've ever had. And the reason is twofold. All businesses are complicated. They, all businesses are complicated uh, because, as Francis Wesley would say, uh, out, of, uh, out of Waterloo, they have certain systems that have to click to make it work. A not-for-profit has complexity added to it because so much is out of our control. The government might decide tomorrow it's going to support brain research in terms, instead of chronic disease. Uh, we could find out that hospitals are getting less funding and become a larger competitor. And, and we can't compete the way I did at Walmart. I, you know, at Walmart, I put a, 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 you know, a, a grocery card out there and say $109, and then you'd put out Zeller's same product, and it would be $125. I can't put out a, 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 a cart that says Canadian Cancer Society, Heart and Stroke, and Canadian Diabetes. So you end up cooperating a lot more with your competitors, which is good. And that's important as we go forward. So if we think of uh, the kind of uh, work that's being done in diabetes following uh, Dr. Banting's uh, uh, discovery, you think of things like the London, uh, you know, London Health Sciences, St. Joe's, uh, the work that David Hill has done in this community. Uh, it's really quite amazing how diabetes is actually a very important part of the fabric of London in terms of the research and institutions. So let me just refresh a bit. What is diabetes? So if you have type 1 diabetes, your pancreas doesn't work and it does not produce any insulin, and therefore, and you're born with that. There's nothing you can do about it except to go on insulin, because insulin is what breaks down sugars to create food energy. And that's why people with type 1 would usually just waste away. They couldn't eat and, and produce energy. Many of type 1 people are uh, children. With type 2, your, your pancreas either doesn't produce enough uh, insulin or your body can't absorb enough insulin. And that then leads you to having type 2 diabetes. And so those are the, the, the two major parts. There's also something called gestational diabetes, which some women will get um, during pregnancy. And then that they have a higher risk of their children having diabetes at a later time. So we have roughly 400,000 people with uh, type 1 diabetes, 5 million with type 2, of which roughly a million five are undiagnosed, and another 6 million with prediabetes, where their, sugars, where their sugar levels, what's called A1Cs, are high, but not high enough yet to be called people with diabetes. But 50% of those will go on to have diabetes. That's one in three Canadians. So look to your left, look to your right, one of you will have diabetes. And so as we then go forward and look at what happens with diabetes, what we realize is that there are a number of contributing factors. Some are cultural. So if you are Asian, South Asian, uh, Aboriginal, or low income, you have a higher degree of getting diabetes, higher propensity. Some of them are socioeconomic. As I mentioned earlier, if you are in a position uh, where you cannot afford to buy your medication, then you will get, you know, what happens is you don't have the lifestyle, you don't have the medications, and you can't eat well, you can't buy your kids uh, the right foods, etc. 
So, and we all understand, you know, uh, social determinants of health, and there are people in your community who deal with this all the time. But if you have diabetes, it's a 24 hour a day disease. It never sleeps. So if I had diabetes, I would be thinking immediately, how much did I eat? How many carbs are those? How much insulin should I pump in? I, am, I would have to be a, a, a constant calculating machine. Okay, and I have to do that myself. I would be testing my blood sugars my, about five times a day. If you're a child, you'll test twice at night. So imagine, and I'll come to it when we talk about camps, imagine a family where every night the parent gets up twice a night to give an injection and test the, uh, test the blood. And it never goes away. And so that's why it wears people down. And it becomes a family affair. So if you have, if you have a child with diabetes or a spouse with diabetes, all of a sudden your eating patterns change. Your sleeping patterns change. Your work patterns play, change. If my wife had diabetes, I'd be sitting here thinking, OK, what happens if she gets a high or a low? Is, are there fruits available? Is there juice available? If she had to inject, where would she go? And you're making that constant calculation all the time. And yet, many people live well with diabetes. You have uh, an example right here in your community uh, with the London Knights, Max Domi. You know, in my day, it was Bobby Clark. So you can live a very full and a very rich life. You just have to self-manage all the time. Now, diabetes often, um, people don't die of diabetes, but they die of the complications. So if you went down to the hospital here, 30% of the people who had strokes will be people who have diabetes. 40% of people with heart attacks will be people with diabetes. 50% of people with on kidney dialysis will be people with diabetes. 70% of non-traumatic amputations will be people with diabetes because it's a vascular disease and they can't feel their hands or their, or their feet. They can literally walk on glass and not know it. So many people with diabetes will constantly check their feet and their hands. And so as a result of that, of those 70%, 90% will then have a lower limb, another uh, amputation. And it's one of the leading causes of blindness because, again, as a vascular disease, it affects your retina. And so we now put that together and we say, well, you know, people can have insulin. Insulin's not a cure. It's just a self-management tool. It's like saying to someone, you know, who, who is suffering from cancer that, oh, you know, you're, you can have chemotherapy every day or every week for the next 40 years. You know, we have to put it in that, in that perspective. So, as I said earlier, diabetes just doesn't affect the person who has it. Many people with diabetes, and we are talking about this earlier, will have higher uh, mental health issues. They suffer more from depression. Why? Because they feel sometimes they're a drain on the family. That, you know, the family has to do everything around them. They have to go to, you know, they have to be careful when they go to restaurants. If they go visit people, they've got to make sure that, the, that you know, that their dietary restrictions are met. And so there's all sorts of, of complications for this. I was in a diabetes clinic and I saw a young man come in who was testing himself. The poor guy is like 18 years old and he comes in with this scrunched up piece of paper and he's trying to monitor himself. You know, when did I check myself? What were the hours? What were my A1Cs? And you know, it's just very difficult for certain people. The cost of diabetes is tremendous, um, not only in terms of 
your eating habits, but also just in terms of your medication. So I, I, I looked at um, London. The average income in London is $39,000, okay? Um, the cost of, of servicing diabetes, if you're a person with diabetes living here in London, is about $3,800 out of pocket. That is t almost 10% of your pre-tax income. I mean, that's a lot of money. And so there are many, many people who can't afford their medication, who can't afford uh, to monitor themselves. So again, I've talked to, to, to parents who will say, I'll say, well, why aren't you managing this? Why aren't you taking your medication? Well, you know, school, back to school is here. I've got to buy new running shoes for the kids. And I can't afford to buy my medication or to buy my test strips. So again, if, if we're looking at these kinds of systemic issues, it takes a lot of people, it takes a coalition, it takes this surprising coalition to try to solve this. If you think of companies, um, the cost of diabetes to your company is high. So for example, our cost of benefits at the CDA run about 18 to 20% higher than the average company. 18 to 20% higher. Why? Because we have more people with diabetes as a percentage that, you know, as it would be in other charities. And so as you look at this for both businesses and the health system, businesses, imagine your, your, uh, your benefits going up. Imagine more absenteeism or presenteeism. Imagine uh, the cost of just your health care, because co health care costs are going to go up by about $18 billion within the next three years because of people with diabetes. And, and then there's other chronic diseases. So what does the Canadian Diabetes Association do? An association that was started by Dr. Best, uh, Banting's colleague, in 1940s um, and became the association in 1953. And our goal is really to help ma people manage diabetes, help them have healthier lives, and find a cure. And so one of the things about helping a cure is the ability to be able to fund that. And one of the great events that you have here that was started, uh, I, I know, by the late uh, uh, Angus, you know, I guess Angus was part of it, and Jack was part of it, and Bill Brady and Mike. Um, they started the meal. It's the largest single fundraiser in Canadian diabetes. It's been going for uh, roughly 34 years, Grant, if I'm correct. Uh, it's raised over $1.6 million for research. And we do a ton of research here just in the City of London. We've invested over $130 million in research over the past several decades. Um, in London, uh, two examples would be at the University of Western Ontario, uh, Dr. Shaq Barati, uh, is funding, it has a study that's being funded to see how the cells in, inside the eyes can be adjusted so that we can reduce um, blindness and hopefully eliminate it. Uh, Amy Burke, who's a doctoral student, is here and she's looking at flavonoids uh, which are found in citrus fruit and, and she's looking to see if they can help reverse obesity. You know, people don't start with saying, you know, I'd really like to become obese. That's not a goal, okay? People have, you know, certain functions, the way their body acts, and we're trying to see is there something we can do to help reduce that? And especially, you know, in an aging population, in a population that is not as active, I mean, you know, you think of it today, I remember my mother just sort of like, you know, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, you were out of the house. You might come back for lunch, and uh, you'd be back at 6 o'clock. 
and you know it was a safer place it was a community and the people didn't worry about the same kind of things but today that just doesn't happen and so this whole issue about uh, activity is important and when you look at research what we're also trying to do is say how do you get more impact more and more funders are saying I'm giving you a million dollars or 500,000 what did you do with it you know one of the biggest challenges in any whether it's cancer or heart you know you've had hundreds of millions of dollars and you still haven't cured cancer you still haven't cured diabetes you still haven't cured heart attacks and donors now are saying we want to see that impact the thing of course is how do you measure impact so in Ontario you created a proxy in Ontario they said we're going to measure impact by saying we're going to reduce wait times because we feel if we reduce wait times for major uh, operations people will be healthier there's actually no uh, evidence that that's actually the case and they haven't been able to track people over 25 years to see that's the case but we do know that it is early prevention and getting in there earlier there's enough evidence to say that that can have impact so we also run camps we're the largest organization that deals with type 1 kids we send over 2500 kids to camp a year um, and we subsidize it at a cost of about two and a half to one. So we spend about three and a half million dollars. We get one million dollars of fees. Um, and, you know, they go to Camp Discovery here in London. But it's a life-changing moment. First, for, for a child, they realize they're not any different. Because for the most part, if you have diabetes and you're a uh, you're, uh, youth, you're probably the only one in your school. Be rare to have two. So there's a sense of, of loneliness, of, of being different. So they go to camp, they find out, you can just see there, they're not any different than anybody else. Number two, they learn how to self-manage, how to inject, how to read their A1Cs, or they'll be introduced to using a pump. And fourth, they get to be kids. You know, it's a fantastic time. And for the parents, whoa, for two weeks, they don't have to wake up every day, you know, every night, twice in the night. And they can maybe go on a vacation with the other children that isn't, that doesn't have to be uh, fettered by what you need for the person with diabetes. So it's a big, big game changer. And, um, you know, they just, it's, it's marvelous when you go there. I go there every year and, and, and the kids will, will, will call it a life-altering experience. You know, that all of a sudden they come back and they have so much more confidence in themselves. Um, you know, there's a quote here, I just, I want to read it because D-Camps really helped my son. He went last year when he was first diagnosed and had so much fun. Things over the year changed for him and he wasn't keeping up with his insulin and being defiant about his high blood levels. This year the counselors helped my son with getting him into a routine and making him want to fight this life-altering disease. That's what I was hoping when he went to D-Camps. You know, that's, that's tugs at your heart because it's what it's all about. One of the things also that we're very proud of is our, uh, is our social enterprise. Um, we're talking about social innovation. We run the largest uh, nonprofit social enterprise in the country. It's called Clothesline. <coughs> Excuse me. We recycle about 100 million pounds of clothing every year. We have about 300 drivers on the road in all provinces with the exception of Quebec. And uh, we are like a logistics company. We take that clothing, we sell it, and all the profits from that business go into the Canadian Diabetes Association. And it's a tremendous organization. I'm, I'm very proud of, of, of what they do. And uh, we're viewed as, uh, as you know, I arguably the best in Canada and one of the best in, uh, in North America and the world on these kind of things. Um, I think a gem for us is, uh, is the museum. We're blessed to have Grant running it. Um, I know he feels incredibly lucky to work with Joe and me. Um, I really, really appreciate that, Grant. Um, 
But uh, Grant, uh, uh, Grant's been a, a great friend over the years, and I got to meet Grant when I, I, I believed that, so, you know, as a CEO, you're a servant leader, right? I mean, that's what your job is. Job is to help lead, but you have to lead by example. And I, I like to communicate and be transparent because people don't, they don't know what's going on. They may not like what I say, but I'd like them at least know what we're trying to do. So Grant does a, uh, I send out an email to everybody, and Grant does a reply, a reply all or sends it up. But my name's still on it, and the email comes up, and it's, it says to the person, he says, why the heck is this guy sending out letters like this? I got better things to do than, you know, than, than read, you know, a page of what he's trying to say. So I... <laughs> I call him back. I say, hey, Grant, I got your email. How's it going? <laughs> and he says, oh, my gosh. And I said, no, that's okay. It's taught me to be really much more short and, and concise because, again, who do you learn from in an organization? You always learn from the people who are closest to the customer, to the people you serve. The day you forget that as, a, as, a, as an executive, you're cooked. So I really, I really appreciated Grant doing that. Um, but, you know, we have a great opportunity, and Grant and I were talking about this morning, we have people coming from 80 countries here. And we generate roughly about $1.3 million a year in economic activity in this city because of the museum. That's a lot of money. And, you know, you gotta remember, the, you know, it's in the East End, and the East End is changing, and now it's rechanging. Um, but that's where this discovery was made and people come here and they go upstairs and they want to lie on the bed that Banting slept on because it changed their lives. It saved their child, it it's, it's saved them. And uh, we've got big plans for that. Uh, we'd like to put uh, a research uh, institute attached to it. We talked to the city at one point in time, they were going to uh, uh, grant us the, the parking lot um, we, we desperately need an elevator because we could triple the amount of people who come, not because of just, you know, physical, like, you know, wheelchair accessibility. There's so many steps, but just as people get older, they can't go up those three or four flights, uh, flights of stairs. And I, I challenge this group in the City of London, if anyone knows anybody at the City of London, for $100,000, you can put an investment in that will probably return a million dollars a year more, year after year after year, because that's how many more people would come and how many tour buses would come. If any of us as business people got a 300%, you know, what was that? That's a tenfold return on investment in your first year, I think we'd be making the investment. Uh, and we'll put money in too. I just don't have a million dollars. Uh, you know, I just don't have a hundred $25,000 or $100,000. So if you're prepared to just leave a check with Grant, that'd be great. But all kidding aside, you know, there's, this is a great thing to do. Um, before I wrap up, I, I'd really like to ask you to do one thing, if you would. We're running diabetes awareness campaign, and there is something called the CANRIS test. The CANRIS test takes two minutes of your time, and if you just did the test, if you just went to diabetestest.ca and did that test, it asks you enough questions to, to say to you whether you should see your, your GP and get tested. And that can be a lifesaver because you might be in a position where you're pre-diabetes and with some lifestyle changes, um, if you walk 30 minutes a day four times a week, you will reduce your chance of getting diabetes by 50% without losing weight. Okay? So take the CAN risk test. Uh, it will help you determine whether you're at, at high risk. Um, you know, it's a, tough, it's a tough market out there. It's a tough market for health charities. Uh, it's a tough market trying to help 12 million, 11 million people across Canada. I'm proud of the work that our people do. I'm proud of the staff we have. I'm proud of the leadership. I'm proud of the people like, like Grant who, who have a vision about how we keep Banting and, and his memory and his work alive. And that's why it's a, an historic site. And I want to thank you and recognize you for, for Grant. Please keep those emails coming in. 
Um, and because you know what? You know, it's like it's always good to have someone uh, pricking your bubble and saying, hey, let's face reality here. So, and I very much appreciate it. I thank you so much for inviting me today. I really appreciate it. Um, and, if, and if all that comes out of this, besides making a bunch of new friends, is that one of you gets tested, who finds out that maybe you're at risk, and you then start taking charge, this, uh, this trip will have paid for itself a million times over. So, and to you in the room that continue to work in the community, keep up the good work. Uh, running a, a not-for-profit, as I say, is playing a lot of chess, and you're to be commended for all the great work that all of you do. Um, and so thank you very much, and uh, thanks for having me. Thanks, Brett.